Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. There was, I think it was a Seinfeld episode, maybe, or an ongoing thing. I don't know. I was not that big a Seinfeld guy. <clears throat> but there was at one point where um, there was a lot of turmoil or stress or whatever. And I think it was George had this little mantra of his, Serenity now! Which he was anything but serene. But I suppose the idea was that if he could say serenity now emphatically enough that somehow that would make him serene. I doubt that it worked, but that's just my take on sitcoms, I suppose. And as Zen practitioners and Buddhists in general, uh, we might all be sitting on our cushion saying, equanimity now! Since the, I don't know, let's, let's just use my family's history for an example. Uh, my grandfather was in the First World War. He and my grandmother both lived through the Depression. My father and mother both lived through the Depression, and my father was in uh, World War II. And then there was, you know, Korea and Mossadegh and uh, probably something going on in the Dominican Republic. And there was Pakistan and India coming into existence because some Brit with a ruler or whatever decided to draw a line in one arbitrary place and they've been at it forever and then there's a whole Israel versus seemingly most of the uh, entire Arab world and then there was that thing in Yugoslavia and so now we find ourselves at, again, the arbitrary dividing line of 2020 going through a pandemic of a scale not seen since the 1918 flu pandemic, which was apparently erroneously named the Spanish flu. I'm not quite sure how that all works. But so here we are getting maybe toward the edge of the pandemic. And then the next thing, you know, it's like, okay, let's get another war going here. So now we have Russia invading Ukraine. And that's not to say that this period, 100 year period of history or so that I just referred to is somehow subject to any more turmoil than any other, because I think if we look back at history, we'll see that if you take any arbitrary chunk of 100 years, there's probably all hell breaking loose in a good portion of it. But this is the one we're living in now. So this is our own personal hell that we're going through. Uh, I've been reading this book recently called Zen Under the Gun. It was translated by uh, J.C. Cleary, who is one of the, as far as I'm concerned, preeminent translators of uh, Chinese and uh, Japanese also, I believe, uh, Zen writings. Some others too, I believe. Anyway, this is uh, something that Zhu Jian wrote, uh, and in, in it he refers to the semblance period. And the semblance period is that portion of history where the outward forms and beliefs and practice of Buddhism still remain, but are largely ineffective. 
So Zhu Jian wrote, here in the last part of the semblance period, Buddhism is gradually declining. Human hearts are pallid and indifferent. Outstanding people are hard to find. The Zen gate is silent and desolate. How Zen has declined in comparison with earlier adepts. In these times, if we want to look for the right people in Zen, they must have spirit bones from past lives and have the power of great vows and ride the wheels of great practice in order to travel the great path free from inversion and error. Why? In these times when the trend is a world in decline, the road poor appears ever more twisted and convoluted. Worldly forms are inordinately chaotic and worn out while desire for worldly profit is thick and flourishing. Thus, worldly affairs have a great influence over people who are sure to be carried off by worldly things if their roots are superficial and their power is shallow. If their practices and vows are not profound, and if they are not completely upright in their inner hearts, once people carry this off, worldly things become a barrier that seals people in, and they cannot escape even if for a minute. People just go on with their petty work. Unworthy mind has another plan. It just wants to profit and nurture itself and outdo others in glory, that's all. Supposedly religious people join together with their cronies and form sects for the deluded factions of devils. If you enter the religious life for these reasons, will your body and mind actually be at peace? Once people have solidified their delusions, all they say and do will be the business of delusion. Since at root their theories are not correct, the things they do miss the mark from the start. If you fall among this type, even if you have some knowledge, what real use will it be? And when I read that today, it was like, yeah, okay. So things weren't that great in the 14th century either and maybe we're still in the semblance age where things resembling zen practice and resembling buddhist teachings still are around but we have distractions we take the bodhisattva vows to help all beings, to cut through all the delusions, to take every opportunity to awaken and embody the Buddha way. And I'm not quite sure how well we're doing that. If we're going to help all beings, that means that uh, that includes Putin and Zelensky. If we're going to uh, cut through delusions, maybe we need to break out of our echo chambers where everybody we know kind of says the same thing, you know? Screw Putin, he's a bastard. We could go on to other examples, but I'll refrain. Um, Are we taking every opportunity presented to us, like war, like pestilence, like famine, like disease, as opportunities to awaken, or are we just taking them as, a, as an excuse to bitch? And while we're doing all this stuff, I propose that we're not really living like a Buddha. The Jin Jin Ming, written by the third patriarch, Sing San, 
starts off with the great way is easy for those with no preferences. Dismiss your feelings about good and bad, right and wrong, and just reflect your true nature, your true Buddha nature. And sometimes that's really hard because Righteous indignation sounds really good sometimes. It feels really good. We kind of like being pitted against somebody else. We really want to think that we're right and the other guy is wrong. And then we hear about interdependence and, uh, okay, not right now, okay? We hear about saving all beings and it's like, eh, not, not today, okay? Wanna save some, but not, not everybody today. And uh, as to taking opportunities to awaken, well, not all of them. They're infinite. I got plenty of room. I got time. And acting like a Buddha, well, you know, not today, okay? I don't, I just, I don't have it in me to do it today. And then, since there's always an and in Zen, if not necessarily a but, there's the and of, well, saving all sentient beings. Does that mean just talking about peace, love, and crunchy granola? And, you know, I'd like to teach the world to sing and hold hands in perfect harmony and all that. Is that a skillful way to save all beings? what beings actually need saving. How do we skillfully determine what correct Buddha action is in these di different situations and the relationships we have to the people involved in them? And it's difficult to determine that from moment to moment. Some people would use the word mindful. Uh, I prefer to say that we just need to pay intense, intense attention to those situations and the relationships around us and find out what our true function is, what the effort, essence of our true nature is. How are we going to embody that? Is it a matter of accepting everything just as it is because it's perfect as it is? Or are we maintaining that, yes, we can accept things, but we don't necessarily have to settle for them. But in our not settling, what exactly are we going to do? And I would say that without practice, even in this semblance age, without doing our damnedest to realize our true Buddha nature, that the likelihood of actually coming up with correct function in response to the situations and the stimuli and the phenomena that we encounter, I don't wanna consider what that necessarily would be like. I would prefer that we practice diligently and that we do strive to realize our true nature and that we do try and live by the Bodhisattva vows 
and try and help all beings and cut through delusions and take the opportunities to awaken as they come to us and then live as Buddhas, the Buddhas that we truly are and figure out a skillful way to work in all these different scenarios that we find ourselves in. <laughs>